Welcome everyone to the Spring 2022 Environmental Resilience Speaker Series jointly presented by Indiana University's Integrated Program in the Environment and the Environmental Resilience Institute. I'm Sarah Mincy, Director of the Integrated Program in the Environment and uh, Managing Director for ERI, and I'm so pleased that you're able to join us today. Before we begin, we wish to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities native to this region and recognize that Indiana University Bloomington is built on indigenous homelands and resources. We recognize the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi and Shawnee people as past, present and future caretakers of this land. Both IPE and ERI are motivated to facilitate conversations with today's leading environmental resilience experts from across the disciplines to address topics from climate change to the socio-environmental challenges that are affecting our health and our communities and our economies around the world. IPE was founded in 2012 by the provost and the leadership of the O'Neill School, the College of Arts and Sciences and the School of Public Health to bring together all of the environmental and sustainability scholarship across the various schools and departments on the Bloomington campus. ERI was founded in 2017 as a part of the IU Prepared for Environmental Change Grand Challenge. Its mission is to co-create environmental resilience and climate solutions through integrated research, education, and community. IPE and ERI faculty, staff, and students have worked together to bring you a robust set of speakers this semester. Um, and we, you'll be able to find information about all of our talks and events on the ERI and IPE web pages and in the regular newsletters and upcoming event notices that our organizations regularly send out. And we encourage you to sign up for our newsletter so you'll be able to keep up with all of that. Finally, a couple important notes. Please put questions for today's speaker into the chat box as you think of them. Uh, I'll monitor those and uh, then I'll be, there'll be an opportunity for us to ask those questions at the end of the talk. At long last, please let me introduce today our speaker, Delone White Newsom. A lifelong learner and advocate, Dr. Delon L. White Newsom founded Empowering a Green Environment and Economy, LLC, a strategic consulting firm with the mission of transforming communities through the development of people-centered solutions. She serves a diverse set of clients with forward thinking and intersectional approaches to tackle issues such as climate change, public health, environmental injustice, and advancing racial equity. Jalan has multi-sector experience, having worked with environmental philanthropy, state government, nonprofits, grassroots, ac academia, and private industry. Most notably, she created and implemented the Transformational Climate Resilience and Equitable Water Systems, or CRUISE, initiative at the Kresge Foundation as a senior program officer. She was the first director of We Act for Environmental Justice's Federal Policy Office in Washington, DC. Her doctoral research illuminated the impact of climate change and extreme heat on the low-income elderly in Detroit and is still referenced to drive public health interventions. A native of Detroit, Jalon earned a PhD in environmental health sciences from the University of Michigan School of Public Health, a master's degree in environmental engineering from Southern Methodist University, a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Northwestern University, and her certificate in diversity and inclusion from Cornell University. She is a writer and a sought after speaker, both nationally and internationally, and serves on multiple national and local academic, nonprofit and for-profit boards. She has been recognized by Grist Magazine, Michigan League of Conservation Voters, and the Environmental Protection Agency for her work in the environmental justice, advocacy and health fields. Dr. Delon is also an adjunct professor at the George Washington University Milken Institute School of Public Health, a lifetime member of Delta Sigma Theta sorority, and a proud mom of Ariel and Gianna Lynn. Jalan, we're happy to have you here today, and I will turn uh, things over to you now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah, for the kind introduction and just for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm going to attempt and hope my slides will share correctly. So let's see here. Can everybody see that before I continue talking? <laughs> It looks good. Okay, awesome, awesome. Well, again, glad to be here and thank you all for coming out on a Friday. Um, I know up here in Michigan, the weather is like looking out my window like gloomy and you know, kind of dreary and it's just like, oh, the weather that I just wanna like sleep in. So I appreciate you all 
uh, sacrificing your time to, to be a part of this conversation today. So before I jump in, uh, I definitely want to acknowledge that I'm calling from southeastern Michigan, uh, my home office here outside of Detroit, on the original lands of the Potawatomi peoples. And again, appreciate your acknowledgement. And, and also, I often add in there, uh, acknowledging my ancestors that have kind of paved the way for me to do the work that I do. Um, I don't take for granted the opportunities for education and uh, just working across this country. And I know I wouldn't be here if not for the folks that came before me. So uh, appreciate again, the opportunity to be here today. Um, I think it's often super important uh, to just really understand where people come from and where they get their perspective before kind of jumping into the, the nitty gritty. And, you know, I am a Midwest girl. I was born in Lima, Ohio. Um, uh, raised in Detroit, Michigan, uh, by a family of educators and social servants. So the fact that I even thought about environmental stuff, uh, that I am a scientist and an engineer, um, that did not come down from my family. But when I was in middle school, um, I had some great teachers that encouraged me to ask questions about science and the environment. And I really got into air and water and waste and, and all those things very early which led me to work at Dow Chemical Corporation in high school as an intern up in Midland, Michigan. And while I was there to be a part of their touch tech mentoring program, um, I started asking questions about some of the spills and accidents and where those spills and accidents were happening as we would of course transfer the herbicides and other things that we produced in the Midland facility across the country. And what I soon learned by asking those questions is that most of those spills and accidents unfortunately happen in low-income communities and communities of color and those communities near the railroad tracks. And so while I was kind of focused again on learning chemical engineering, this thing around environmental justice uh, uh, became real to me. And when I left Midland and came back to Detroit, I just really started looking around and realizing that in my own community, there were some huge challenges. The fact that around my church, which is the second picture on the left, that there was a high prevalence of lead exposure for our babies and our children. The fact that when I went to, or when I tried to go shopping for my great aunt, who is now 104 years old, living by herself in Detroit, I had to go 15 or 20 miles outside of the city to actually go to a grocery store that had fresh vegetables and meat that you would actually want to eat. And so again, I would talk to my other aunts and, and realize that for some reason, they seem to have higher levels of asthma in certain communities and, and begin to make the connections between air quality and, and the health impacts that we were seeing. And so again, it was like this realization that right in my backyard, there were these things going on <laughs> that weren't right. But then I went on to Evanston uh, to Northwestern. And again, while I was focused on engineering, I dual majored in journalism and you know, had an opportunity to spend some time on the South side of Chicago with an organization called People for Community Recovery. And you know, they just shared with me a lot of the challenges in their community from being, uh, again, close to a lead smelter, wastewater treatment plant, I mean, you name it. Uh, any type of environmental exposure that's possible. And it just, again, confirmed that what I was seeing in Midland, in Detroit, and now in Chicago was not unique, and that this was something that was unfortunately pervasive across our country. There was environmental injustice, unfortunately, present in many places, particularly impacting low-income communities and communities of color. But Again, it became realer, if that's a word, to me when I was um, acting as the, the caregiver, primary caregiver for my grandparents in Detroit. And so, um, you know, they were in their 80s and 90s and really dealing with kind of dementia and the onset of Alzheimer's. But for some reason during that same time, it's like the weather just seemed to be hotter. <laughs> it's like, you know, the intensity of summers, the, the longevity of how hot days lasted 
uh, was really, you know, not only impacting me, but I could see it impacting my grandparents, the way they acted or didn't act. And so it was really a concern which drove me to begin to investigate that as a part of my doctoral research, particularly the impacts of extreme heat, hot weather, whatever you want to call it, on the low income elderly. And so what was then striking to me as I began to dig into climate change and extreme heat is that I realized I was actually in Chicago during the time of um, the heat wave of 1995, which took the lives of many uh, elderly in Chicago. Again, mostly low-income people in community of color, communities of color. And then I realized I was also in Paris, France in 2003 during the large Parisian heat wave, again, that unfortunately took the lives of thousands of Parisians. And so it, again, all of this irony that I was a part of these tragic events, but not until it impacted me personally through my grandparents, did I really realize that this, this climate change thing and this, this extreme heat is this invisible threat that in my opinion, no one should have to die from. But again, it wasn't just the fact that these things were happening, that the weather was changing, but I started to realize there were other factors that were contributing to this vulnerability of place. And the fact that there wasn't a lot of green space in my grandparents or where my grandparents lived, um, it cost a lot to, to pay for their air conditioning. So they normally did not want to turn the air conditioning on and their bodies were not able to thermoregulate like they used to when they were younger. Um, the fact that they didn't want to open windows because they did not feel safe um, in their community. And again, the other sources of pollution that were in their environment. So again, when you talk about environmental injustice, it's typically the, the accumulation of multiple factors that uh, contribute to that like whole sphere of vulnerability. And then I came back to Michigan after spending some time in DC and, and went to work for the Kresge Foundation. And about the same time, um, you know, there started to be more intense flooding. And unfortunately, uh, you know, I thought I was kind of done with like the extreme weather impacts and dealing with heat and understanding that, but this hit home as well. And what I learned very quickly is that the city of Detroit and many other cities, post-industrial cities, uh, that have very old, old pipes underground were not able to handle the increase in intensity of flooding because of climate change. And so here is unfortunately on the right-hand side, my parents' basement uh, from last summer, um, about eight feet of water that came into their basement and their car actually flooded across the driveway to the fence across the street. And so after about five floods in two and a half years, you know, again, my advocacy and, and trying to understand why certain communities, particularly communities on the east side or historically red line communities or communities that are considered low income or communities of color were again, trying to pick up the pieces after being repeatedly insulted and traumatized by these floods. And when you think about why these things happen, Again, from a systemic perspective, you know, where does the maintenance happen or not happen in these communities? Um, is there green stormwater infrastructure to help prevent and mitigate some of these flooding things that happen? And then let's not talk about the response or really the lack of response and recovery that comes or doesn't come to some communities. So again, there have been decades of flooding that has happened across these communities in Detroit that has really, you know, gone unnoticed and, and not been significant enough. But again, the result of environmental injustice. And so there's enough research and I would say experience that doesn't leave the question unanswered that certain folks suffer more. Uh, certain folks are made to be more vulnerable because of their level of income or their status, social economic status, or their ethnicity or their education. Um, this, again, fairly recent study from the Environmental Protection Agency, again, is just another one of the many that show that there is an issue and it's not just anecdotal. 
And then we've also started in the research to quantify the way legacy policies in our country, such as redlining, have impacted certain communities and made them more vulnerable to climate impacts. And so because you have redlined communities that were historically only the places that people of color or immigrants could live, we, we also learned that these were the places that were underdeveloped, that did not have appropriate or adequate infrastructure, or sometimes no infrastructure at all, from water piping to hospitals, et cetera. And so when you think about these places now in our new climate reality, you know, they, they are more at risk. And whether that's urban heat island effect or flooding. So that is the reality of, of, of legacy policies that we are still feeling today. And the driver for all this is dirty air, you know, and, you know, where we're getting our, our energy from primarily, again, still dirty sources of energy, even though we're slowly transitioning to clean and renewable fuels, those stationary sources or power plants, coal-fired power plants, as well as the mobile sources continue to hit disproportionately communities of color. And then even as I think about, and as I talk about with some of my students, the regulations that have been on the books since before I was born <laughs> in the early seventies, how some people still remain unprotected. Now I will say again, we are doing much better than we were before the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, but there are still communities that are not thriving and we have a ways to go. And I think about when I worked in industry, um, when I was actually in doing engineering and chemical engineering in, in several plants in Texas and other places, and how I would just witness and still see communities that have the most egregious offenders <laughs> were still low-income communities and communities of color wherever I worked. And unfortunately, the, the enforcement was inadequate the the transparency didn't exist there was no real partnership with the communities and again there were so many <laughs> issues baked into this system that again it was hard to really address these issues of legacy racism that were present back then and in some cases still very present today and when I think about the environmental justice movement and kind of the beginnings, whether you believe it started with the sanitation worker strike that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. led in Memphis, Tennessee, or this particular um, act of civil disobedience by the folks in Warren County, North Carolina that were protesting uh, against waste, PCB waste coming into their community. Again, this movement and the need for environmental injustice is and still alive and well, and it's more needed than ever, um, even decades later, which again is always amazing to me how we are still fighting the same fights that folks were fighting decades ago with more tools. So in all that, when we talk about justice, I hope you, agree or maybe not, that justice is not the reality for many communities across this country still. But the question that I have for you is, you know, in lieu of justice, can we still have resilience? And like most of you all, um, possibly on this call, I, I love definitions and I love words. And I think about some of the partners and places that I've worked um, throughout my career and how everybody had a different definition of resilience. <laughs> and so, you know, resilience in some ways can be provide, you know, defined as, you know, um, you know, dealing with disruption or rapid recovery or um, systems that remain adaptable. And, you know, the one that I've always thought was very interesting was this notion of, of, of bouncing back or bouncing forward. And, you know, again, all these different, these definitions I feel are very valid. But for me, when I think about the rubber band analogy, which I've heard too many times, you know, my question is, you know, can there be resilience if the rubber band is broken? And when I think about the rubber band, I think about the systems that that represents. And can we actually get resilience in a broken system. 
And so I think it's my job and our job and hopefully your job to fix these broken systems so we can get to a more resilient society. But I wanna also offer a definition that I came across several years ago that is just stuck with me. And you know, this is a community-based organization in LA that works on healing justice. And you know, I think while our society often applauds the resilience of communities. Oh my gosh, they are so strong and they are super resilient and you know, yada, yada, yada. You know, I have a problem with that because it's like, why are we uh, praising folks that shouldn't have to deal with what, uh, with, with, with kind of the harm and, and, and the, the issues that we as a society have allowed to happen onto them. So why should they have to be super resilient? <laughs> and so when I think about this definition from this organization that talks about the purpose of resilience being not to build the capacity of folks to endure more harm, but actually how do we begin to confront those systems that harm us is really how we begin to build resilience. And so when I think about the communities that I've worked in, when I think about my parents and my grandparents, again, I don't want to build them up to be able to endure more harm. My job is to confront and deal with those systems so the harm is taken away. But I looked at your website and I was really excited about ERI's definition of environmental resilience and the fact that your work seems to be, and I'm still learning, very intersectional and that you talk about getting to the root causes of disturbance, which I think is what we need to get to if we are gonna actually get to justice. So when we think about, or when I think about it, environmental justice and racial equity is this aspiration. Uh, you know, it is, it is a, a movement, a process that is trying to address environmental injustices or racial inequity. So that is what we're striving for. That, that is the goal. But we have to often, again, account for those barriers that keep us from getting there. You know, the personal biases, you know, when people use power for their own good and not for the good of the people, where privilege, uh, the fact that some folks' lives are, are valued differently than others are not valued at all. And then, you know, some companies and, and other entities, you know, don't have accountability. <laughs> they can do whatever they want and have impacts, uh, whether they be negative or positive, and, and, and no one, again, holds them to any uh, sort of values or, or constraints. And then when we talk about environmental injustice, this, this notion of what I call differential protection, the fact that some people deserve to be protected and others don't, that's a problem. And when we think about climate change, even with the recent intergovernmental, uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change report that was, I think, released earlier this week, you know, it talks about how, again, climate change mitigation, um, you know, it can't just be a switch to cleaner energy sources, but it has to be a cultural transformation. And I think that's so important because a lot of the barriers that I just mentioned. It, it, they can't be solved technologically. It has to be a cultural transformation that allows us to see broader beyond what our personal needs are, but how what we do impacts everyone around us, even the folks that we might not know, the decisions that we make. So super important, again, as we think about how do we overcome these barriers to achieve justice and resilience. And so while I don't have a, a simple answer, there's a, a little acronym that I developed that I think gets us a little bit closer to what are some of those, those things that we can do to achieve that aspiration of environmental justice and, and equity. And so I'll share some brief examples as well, but I like to think about this in terms of the acronym ADAPT. So acknowledging the harm, demanding accountability, addressing racism, power, and privilege, prioritizing equity and transforming systems. So let's start with acknowledging harm. So to me, when I think about acknowledging harm, and this is conversations I have with my partners and clients and, and other folks, it means really understanding as a decision maker, um, as a corporation, as an entity that, 
you know, you might come up with solutions and you might mean well, but oftentimes those solutions and practices and policies that you implement end up not benefiting all people and have unintentional negative consequences. And so this again comes to mind as we think about this transition from internal combustion engine vehicles uh, to electric vehicles. And I'm, I'm focusing on the Midwest because that's where we're at. And I recently uh, dug into this question of what are the climate justice and environmental justice implications of this EV transition. And again, what's awesome is that transitioning to cleaner fuels and pulling away from fossil fuels can only be beneficial in terms of air quality and, and you know, improving air quality. But with that, we have to think about the, the bigger picture because with that transition comes, okay, even though we move to these electric vehicles, if we still continue to plug into dirty energy sources, those same communities that are bumped up next to these power plants are gonna to continue to really not get the benefits of this transition that is supposed to benefit everyone. And another big piece of it is that when we think about the automotive sector in general, that there are some legacy issues that still need to be rectified from a long time ago. So I had an opportunity to interview 30 or so organizations, community-based organizations, health experts around the heartland, uh, you know, Indiana, uh, Ohio, and Michigan. And, you know, one of the major issues that came up, one of the major themes that folks raised in these conversations was legacy pollution. And I bring this up in the acknowledge harm category because oftentimes we wanna just move forward. We wanna move forward with policy and practice and solutions, but we don't wanna think about the past. We don't wanna acknowledge that there is a brownfield st still here in a certain community where you're trying to now build a new EV facility or electric vehicle manufacturing facility. So how do we make sure that our entities, our organizations, our decision makers, and even our researchers acknowledge the harm that has been done in the past so we can move forward in a more just and equitable future. And that's just one example. But I also want you to really think about, and, and I'm gonna take it a little bit away from the Midwest, um, but this legacy of harm from the petrochemical industry. Um, I'll be uh, sharing a, a, a paper very soon, putting it out into, into the public, but had an opportunity to talk with over 80 organizations that are advocating against, again, the petrochemical industry in Texas, Louisiana, and the Ohio River Valley. And, you know, for the past several months, it has just become very clear to me that there is such a harmful legacy and there is a lack of acknowledgement of harm from this industry as a whole to what they have actually done to the folks and the communities in these areas. The fact that there are cancer clusters and high rates of asthma and other adverse health outcomes that are experienced by communities living on the fence lines of these facilities. And for some reason, people do not want to acknowledge this connection of health outcomes, adverse health outcomes to the petrochemical industry. And so this lack of acknowledgement, the lack of acknowledging past harms and current harms, again, will continue to perpetuate this injustice and lack of resilience that these communities experience. So in a nutshell, we gotta acknowledge harm. The second is demanding accountability. And so, during the Obama administration, I had an opportunity to serve again as the director of federal policy for a community-based environmental justice organization working in DC. So, you know, had the opportunity to collaborate with a bunch of environmental justice leaders across the country through a national coalition. I mean, we worked on all sorts of policy and, and great stuff, but one of the things in particular that I wanted to raise was our work on the clean power plan which was, again, this, this, this plan by the Environmental Protection Agency to reduce emissions from coal-fired power plants. And so what we tried to do as a coalition was to, to make sure that both the federal government and the state government, so the state agencies that were gonna have to implement what the feds put in place around the Clean Power Plan, we wanted them to be accountable, to make sure that 
again, the states would conduct the proper analysis, which is what we call an environmental justice analysis, to make sure that, again, if there were any negative or disproportionate impacts that were going to come from new or proposed policy solutions, that they would mitigate it from the start. And so this was something that had never been done before or actually put in print uh, as a part of a, a rule or regulation. And so this was seminal. And even though, again, unfortunately, the Clean Power Plan did not get passed, um, it set into play, uh, I think, the foundation for a lot of the work that we're seeing today. The fact that you know we have all of these screening tools that allow agencies, government officials, whomever, to look at a, a range of data to help really guide their decisions. Now, the, the screening tools don't tell the whole story, which is why you're supposed to, again, ground truth it with community voice and wisdom, but it is at least a start in a way that we can require accountability from the folks that make decisions that impact us all. The next one is really is super important, addressing racism, power, and privilege. And so I had the opportunity for about five years to work in philanthropy, and um, which I would say in many ways is very similar to other sectors I learned. And so philanthropy, the word itself means love for mankind or something like that. And what's very interesting and what I learned being in philanthropy in my short time was that there are deep legacies of racism and abuse of power and privilege in the philanthropic sector. Now, if you're unaware, as I was coming into philanthropy, I had no idea. I was like, okay, I'm in a position to give money away. That How could that not be good? Well, if you look at philanthropy historically, there has been you know, a lack of funding in certain areas of this country. So for example, the Gulf Coast and the Deep South you know, are notoriously underfunded compared to other parts of this country. When you think about the historic underfunding of communities uh, of color and low-income communities or organizations led by people of color, severely underfunded. And then in sometimes, you know, philanthropy has a way of using their power and pushing uh, solutions in communities that don't have the buy-in of those communities and can sometimes make a situation worse. So, you know, while overall philanthropy is a good thing, you know, the practice of philanthropy can sometimes have the reverse effect. And so for Midwest Foundation, the Mott Foundation, they asked me to really explore this question around environmental philanthropy, how they could, you know, do their practice better as a part of a group of Midwest funders to support Black, Indigenous, and people of color-led organizations in their practice. And, you know, again, I had just left philanthropy. So this was very, again, close and near and dear to my heart and what I tried to do in my practice. But, you know, out of the many recommendations <laughs> that I offered, um, which again, you can find the report on my website, the first step that I really shared with them was to begin to look in the mirror because you can only address racism or be aware of your power, or understand your privilege when you look in the mirror and put your organization in the mirror. So a lot of these changes that organizations try to quickly make to, you know, um, you know now DEI and, and advancing racial equity is the cool thing. And it's a good thing, but the process and the transformation that needs to happen must be a part of that. It is not a quick fix. It is not a sprint, it is a journey. And so as we think about, again, how you address racism, power, and privilege, it begins with looking in the mirror and really thinking about what are the ways that we need to change as an organization, change our culture, and, and even looking at yourself. And so I am excited because, you know, as we think about addressing racism, power, and privilege, and particularly the deployment of resources, financial resources, which you know we could go farther, but I decided to focus on resources. I'm excited to see what this current administration is doing. And the fact that, again, when you think about the distribution of monies from a federal level, from a state level, um, in my work, whether it's in water, climate, et cetera, there have often been communities that have been 
left out <laughs> or maybe gotten the trickles of, of, of funding for many systemic reasons. And so I am hopeful that things like the Justice Sporty Initiative and using the climate and economic justice screening tool will help ameliorate some of those inequities, particularly in the areas of climate change and reducing legacy pollution. So I am excited that um, and hope that these monies and resources will, in fact, get to these disadvantaged communities as, as they've been defined by the federal government. Next is E, and that is around prioritizing equity. And so I would imagine in this audience, which, audience, which I'm not sure of all the folks that are here, that, you know, you might be from academia, you might be a teacher, high school teacher, or students, or just someone interested in this topic. And I firmly believe that regardless of where you sit and what role you hold or titles behind your name, whatever, that we all have an obligation to prioritize equity and justice. It is needed in our research, it's needed in our practice, it's needed just in the way we treat each other. And so I encourage my partners and clients to really reflect on a couple of key sets of principles that I have used um, my gosh, for a couple of decades now to guide not only my work when I was working in the environmental justice space in particular, but also my work now as a consultant. And if you haven't heard of them, I encourage you to Google them. They're the principles of environmental justice, which again is this beautifully articulated 17 principles that were created at the People of Color Summit in DC uh, several years ago um, that really talks about you know, the, the stewardship of, of the earth and, and how we as people and governments and entities, uh, you know, need to be in right relationship with the earth. And I will tell you any environmental justice organization or any organization that claims that they're an environmental justice organization, if what they do does not align with these principles, then I would question their alignment with environmental justice. The second piece are the HMS principles of democratic organizing. And these are really cool because what it does, they were created in fact for you know, groups that come together with different perspectives, very different perspectives. And the ways that you, again, work together, um, uh, I would say talk together, make decisions together, just some constraints for that process, which again, I have used in, in many instances. So again, I would encourage you to check these out, um, see how they can relate and maybe be useful to your work and maybe develop, again, some principles of your own. And so last but not least is the T of transforming systems. And, you know, I truly believe, and I've always loved butterflies since I was a kid, that you know, transformation is necessary in so many different spaces. And as we think about all the different systems that impact our ability to be resilient and our ability to address climate change, you know, they're major, but they all have an opportunity to improve. And if it's taught us nothing else, when we think about our public health systems and how they've had to really transform to deal with this COVID crisis over the past two, two and a half years. When we think about the ongoing transition of our energy sector and again, what that means and how are we gonna make sure that everybody benefits or has access to solar energy or electric vehicles or whatever. The transformation that we've had to make as maybe parents or teachers in terms of how we educate our students, you know, how we have transformed our educational system to sometimes, in many cases, be primarily virtual. Um, there's still, in my opinion, a lot of transformation that needs to happen in terms of our response and recovery systems. We're going to unfortunately continue to see more extreme weather and my heart goes out to those folks in the south and southeast that are going through some extreme weather right now but you know it's inadequate and i've seen it again in my parents situation and our you know challenges with dealing with fema the federal emergency management agency so there needs to be some transformation that happens so they can appropriately respond and help folks recover and get back to normal life how we value water and think about the importance of water. You know, is it commodified or is it a relative of ours? You know, we need to, again, think about how we think about these, our natural resources. 
And I think almost even more importantly, the transformation of our legal system. I've been really excited to see the use of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which does not allow discrimination, particularly with federal funds. And I've seen a couple of communities kind of using that in a way where it's been kind of pushed away before to again, try and achieve climate justice and environmental justice. And so I am just, you know, again, excited about the impending transformations of just a few of the systems that again, it impact our, our climate resilience. And each of these systems, if really integrated in a beautiful way, have an opportunity to help us meet those aspirations. And I think when I, when I started thinking about like, what does this mean when we talk about transforming systems? You know, oftentimes, which is, you know, I would say a challenge in most organizations and particularly government, you know, is this kind of silo, like, you know, I work on my thing and that's what I worry, and that's what I worry about, that's what I work on, I'm, I'm doing my thing, I'm working in my silo. But if we are going to deal with this huge <laughs> challenge of addressing climate change, we can no longer afford to work in our silos. And um, I wanna say uh, later part of last year, I proposed this, this, this kind of matrix that really gets at, you know, what does it mean to address climate and environmental justice gaps, but do it in a way where you have these big sectors and fields working together. And what I'd like to say is that each sector, industry, government, academia, philanthropy, whatever, they all have something to offer. They have a contribution but how we integrate those offerings and really focus on the gaps is super important. But even with all we have to offer and, and having a great plan, what's most important is that whatever we do, whatever solutions and policies, et cetera, that we come up with that we think are super cool, it has to be informed and shaped by people. And that is why I intentionally at the bottom of this put people because they and the folks that are being impacted have to shape the agenda, they have to form the agenda, they have to continue to demand accountability and make sure that what they need is in the center of these solutions. So my question to you is again, are you willing to adapt <laughs> and change the trajectory of communities across this country or even in your, in your backyard, your community, through your research, your advocacy, your policy making, your teaching, um, what is that legacy that you want to leave, that you are called to leave? Because a part of this conversation is, is how do we uh, change that legacy where it's something that we're proud of, that's actually gonna make folks better off than, than what we're dealing with now. And my motivation, I would say really for this, this thing about legacy um, is that we have a bunch of little people depending on us. And I often look back at this picture and this was, you know, several years ago, my daughters are the two little brown girls to the right with the ponytails and barrettes, and now they're both taller than me. So this has been a while, but we had a conversation with uh, the former administrator, Gina McCarthy in DC several years ago, talking about clean air and environmental justice. And, um, you know, we, we brought our children and, and we talked about this stuff. And so again, we have to remember that what we do now um, in whatever roles that we have, you know, this is what it's about. And so again, I hope that my legacy is something that my girls will be proud of. And I hope you are contributing to a legacy that the folks that come after you will be proud of. So thank you so much for all the work that you do. And I look forward to a discussion if we have some time. Thank you so much, Delon. That was an amazing talk. Um, I, I want to first start with just acknowledging, I like to do this with folks who tell their personal stories and, uh, and in those stories, I hear that they have, you know, a family connection to the injustice <laughs> that they're working on. I, I know that that puts people in a, in a difficult position and, uh, and I just appreciate the, the advocacy and the work that you're doing and, and balancing that personal aspect of it. Um, thank you. For, for this work. Um, also, thank you for acknowledging ERI's definition of resilience. Um, that was that was crafted recently um, by by our team, um, and 
that it went along with you know sort of a a restructuring and of our mission and our vision statement and strategic planning and all of that kind of stuff and we thought really carefully about that so I'm I'm glad that you you saw that and that that you think it's pointed in the right direction. Um, Abby. Uh, who, who's on the call said, how can an institute like ERI, which focuses on environmental justice as well as other climate issues, be helpful um, supporters of the call to funders to support environmental justice initiatives? She says, I'm struggling with how this, how we can do this better. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, that question. And, you know, what I will say is, from my experience on the funding side, you know, philanthropy is, in general, is going through a transformation. And I think it's a good thing. They are having um, some realizations from, you know, not only COVID, but, you know, a lot of the, the racial deaths that have occurred from George Floyd, like, you know, everybody's realizing like, oh my gosh, what, what are we doing and how are we doing it? And, and is it actually impactful? So I think, one of the, the, the ears that philanthropy, well, philanthropy has always, I think, well, in my opinion, been open to hearing uh, researchers and those that are deep in the field. And so the fact that you, in many ways, kind of have that, that ear of philanthropy where some other organizations don't, um, when we talk about the, the lack of networking that many community-based organizations, uh, communities of color-led organizations don't have, you can help be a conduit. Um, because again, I worked at, you know, my office was in a, the office of the Big Green organization of the Sierra Club in DC. And I saw the drastic differences of how they had the ears of funders versus the organization I worked with, where it's like we had to get connected through other people. So I think that is one tangible way. If you're able to kind of elevate the work that you're doing, but also be that connector to organizations that might not have those connections, that is huge. And oftentimes, I mean, I hate to say it, you know, kind of validating the work <laughs> of community organizations and environmental justice organizations, which, you know, I hate to even say that, but man, like when you talk about one of the things that I think needs to be changed in philanthropy is that oftentimes, you know, program officers, they don't have a school for program officers of how to be good grant makers. So you come in with your own biases as a program officer. It's like, okay, well, I know these sets of people and this is who I'm comfortable with and yada, yada, yada. So I think another thing that you can do is begin to expand their horizons. If you know that there are organizations that are in your mix or in the community that don't have those connections and, and might not have been in that circle, um, just make it happen. So hopefully that helps, Abby. Excellent. Thank you for your thesis on this too. I would really look forward to pulling your report and reading that. Um, just real quick, are there any key researchers working in this space, um, books that you, you came across that you think are good or any key articles? In terms of how <laughs> foundations should, um, Oh boy. Um, I'm sure they're in the references of your report. So, I mean, there's one that I, this is so ri ridiculous. Okay. I will, I will get back with you. Like there's one on the tip of my tongue that I can't like the one that I read. Um, yeah. Oh my gosh. And it's a gentleman. Oh, this is so horrible. Okay. Oh, you'll think of it while we're talking. Yes. 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 Later, sure. <laughs> Let me write that down. Yes. yes. There's several. There's several. And of course, like you said, the report is on your website. So folks can pull that down and find um, yes. those references. So um, I was curious if um, you could tell us a little bit more about the Justice 40 initiative um, and some of those other policies that are coming down from, from the administration right now. Yeah. So and, and I'll give a little bit of context. So when I was working again at Cresby in the water space, one of the biggest challenges that for water utilities that were able to, you know, again, kind of, you know, uh, rebuild their infrastructure based on rates, um, it, it was really limited because you don't want to like overcharge people to do the, the maintenance that you need to do. So then of course, maintenance doesn't happen. 
But another source of fundings are state revolving funds, as an example, which is, again, money that you know, comes from federal, goes through state, and then it's distributed. But part of the challenge with that process is that oftentimes when it gets to the state level, the same communities end up getting the funds because the communities that aren't able to get the funds are usually those that are low capacity, under-resourced, or serving, again, communities, um, low rate-based payers. And so there's been this consistent inequity in, again, how funds get to these disadvantaged communities. So that's just one example of what Justice 40 and the Justice 40 initiative is trying to ameliorate. How do we intentionally <laughs> make sure that we create a strategy and a process by which we target these communities, these disadvantaged communities to, to get these funds. And so that is why I'm so excited because when you talk about systemic things that it's not that the communities don't want it, it's just that they either don't have the capacity to apply, you know, the, the folks in house to know how to. And so the Justice 40 initiative is something that each federal agency, so from Department of Energy to Ag to whatever, that they have to figure out how 40% of their funding has to reach disadvantaged communities. Now that's not easy. And I would tell you for some agencies where environmental justice has been like this thing, but not really operationalized, it's, it's some, it's some uh, education, and, and transformation that is happening in real time. So that is it. And that's why I'm excited. But again, you know, the real thing is going to be looking back a couple of years later, you know, did that really happen? And, and, and how did it happen? And did it actually do what it was intended to do, this initiative? So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistically hopeful, yeah. um, cautiously hopeful. I'll say it like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's so. So uh, that piece of the puzzle is there with Justice Forty Initiative. Um, it, this goes right to a question from one of our listeners. Anaga asks, "How would you advise local governments that are trying to improve their engagement with the public and their outreach, uh, and incorporate equity into their climate action planning, but struggling with reaching some communities and getting their participation and input?" Yeah, I, I mean, so. You know, this is, I think, just a classic question of how do you begin to build relationship? I, I don't want to say I don't like the word engagement, but I don't like the word engagement because <laughs> to me, it seems like it's OK, it happens and then it's over. Like I bring you in for this purpose and then poof, I'm done with you. So what I advise folks to do is really try and figure out how do we begin to build relationship, not just when you need something from an organization or an entity, or you want to find out something, but how do you show up in the places where they are? So if they're having community meetings, just show up, sit in the back, listen, figure out what's important, what they value, yada, yada, yada. And then as you begin to build that relationship, you know, there becomes an opportunity for partnership. But, you know, no one wants to feel, and, and I will say, in my opinion, having worked for state government, oftentimes, if you're coming with your government hat on, there is some mistrust. Um, there, there is kind of legacy stuff that you have to address as well. So when I talk about acknowledging harm, you know, it's also the ways in which people have been mistreated or unheard in the past. So just know when you, you know, come into spaces where you're trying to build relationship with new communities um, and kind of do that engagement that you need to make sure that you understand the context of the situation, the historical pieces, acknowledge the harm, come in with a, a spirit of humility, and then really look at this as not a one-off, but something that you can continue to build on and build on over time. So, you know, particularly as it relates to climate planning, what I would say is that, you know, I think, I mean, the unfortunate thing is climate change is you, I don't think you have to fight hard to talk about it now, whether people ascribe to how climate change, you know, whether it's, you know, pushed by human anthropogenic human emissions or not, the impacts are happening. So, you know, that is a, a segue, again, a, a beautiful segue, an unfortunate segue that, okay, if this thing is happening in this community, you know, how can we work together to, to, to mitigate it? 
or not even mitigate, just to, to, to stop it from impacting you in a negative way. So I think, again, our reality, unfortunately, um, provides that, that on-ramp to have these conversations around climate that would have been much harder to have in the past. But always remember that, again, I'm probably talking too much, but you know, really understanding what are the values and concerns of that community and then how, with what you're trying to do, can, can kind of support what they value and what they need with what you're trying to do as a government agency or official. Yeah, yeah. That reminds me of some great research out of your um, home area uh, in Detroit. Um, Maureen McDonough and other researchers did work with urban forestry there, and they talk about heritage narratives oh. in the communities. Um, these are the stories of leg the legacies of, of, you know, government policies there that that created inequities and those became narratives of the community. And if you don't know those narratives, you probably shouldn't go in there and try to, you know, put down policies without understanding, you know? So, yes, yes. Um, Hannah asks, from your perspective, what are the most actionable ways corporations must address their legacy pollution and harm? And Ben follows up with that to say, it's hard to think that corporations will voluntarily admit past wrongdoing and harm, open themselves up to lawsuits and then spend tons of money to make things right. Do you see paths forward that aren't going to breed resentment and probably lobbying? Oh my goodness. That, I mean, that question is so on time because <laughs> this is actually a question that I am addressing with a current client. Um, and that liability piece that you mentioned is, is so critical because if you are as a big corporate, whatever entity, transparent uh, in what you could have caused, <laughs> you know, that not many folks, corporations are willing to do that. So, you know, again, I haven't spent most of my career in private industry and knowing and sometimes having tears in my eyes fighting with my plant manager, like we cannot do this the way that we've been doing it. We have to be transparent with this community. We have this release. I mean, it is, is, it is sometimes a hard battle. And this was like 20 plus years ago in Texas. So if you can just, it, it was even worse. <laughs> but, you know, I think now, again, there is an opportunity because, boy, just this, this notion of racial equity and justice and even the diversity and inclusion um, work that's happening within these corporations, um, this, is, this is the time. And I think that there is a way that, you know, companies, and again, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know what this means, but I, I think that there is a way that companies can thoughtfully acknowledge that, okay, yeah, we have done this but really think about, okay, so what is the path forward? So I, I am just not for just saying, okay, let's just think about how we move forward, but just saying, hey, I mean, cause in most cases in the plants that I've been in, the folks that cause the harm are typically not even there anymore. There was a different way of operating. It was okay to put that 55 gallon drum behind the, the whatever and just leave it there, right? So. I think that there is a way, and this is very specific to whatever company, to acknowledge the things that have happened um, and then think about, okay, you know, how do we move forward? And again, I, I don't have a straight answer for you because this is something that we're talking through with their legal <laughs> as well, but there has to be something. There has to be some acknowledgement, even if it's a statement or a commitment or, you know, a way that you are showing you know, like, okay, community, we care. Let's bring you in. Let's, you know, create a community advisory committee that actually helps direct how we move forward. Like there are ways that you can, a uh, company can begin to, oh yeah, show that, that, show that they really are, are meaningful about, about next steps. Now, again, that could be different when you're thinking about some of the petrochemical industry and the plants in Louisiana and how a lot of the industry is so embedded into the lives of folks that you're dealing with a whole different dynamic because again, the, the, the industry logo is on the t-shirts of the baseball team. Uh, they put food on my table. 
Um, they've, you know, supported my family for generations and generations. So that conversation might be a little bit different depending on where you're at. So yeah, not, not an easy question. Not easy, not easy, but, but thank you for that answer. And, and this entire presentation, just so much critical thought about these issues that are critical issues themselves. Um, so uh, Jalon, thank you for your time. Thank you for your energy. Thank you for challenging us. Um, thank you for giving us some tools, I think, that are very useful for us to use. We appreciate awesome. your time today. No, oh, thank you all. And thanks for the questions and good luck, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And everyone, um, this concludes the, the Resilient Speaker for speaker series for this semester. Um, happy we ended on this note with Jalon. Um, next, uh, two weeks from now, would have been another speaker, but it's Earth Day on April 22nd. So I want to challenge you to use the time uh, when we're not sitting here listening to a speaker to go out and um, do some good in the world and take up uh, some of the challenges that Jalon has offered to us. Thank you all. Have a Thanks great day. Bye-bye. So